Well, good afternoon, folks. Great to be here with you. Uh, this is a really exciting time. I've been in this job three years now, and uh, kind of starting with a new guy in town, it was important for me to put everybody on the same course of action, and so I established five priorities for Southern Company and all of our subsidiary companies across the Southeast. In fact, now, we're not just in Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and Florida. We now have businesses in Texas, New Mexico, Nevada, California, the Carolinas, lower Florida. So we, uh, we're moving all over the place. Getting 26,000 people aligned is important. So I put in place five priorities. Number one is to make sure that everybody buys into the business model. That is putting customers in the middle of everything we do and defining our effect on those customers by providing the best reliability, the lowest prices, best customer satisfaction ever. The second priority is to be successful in our major projects. We have Plant Vogel, the big nuclear plant you may be familiar with, as well as Plant Radcliffe, David Radcliffe, my predecessor, we named it after him, a really innovative 21st century coal technology we're building in Mississippi. Innovation in both of those. Third, to be a leader in the United States in national energy policy, we really have a preeminent position, Southern Company does, in trying to advance the discourse of where we should go in the United States. And I really think, and I'll finish up with this concept, it is a way for the public of the United States to play offense in what is otherwise a challenged environment. And you will find elements of innovation in that, because as you know, with the advent of renewables and new technology that permits greater energy efficiency and a variety of other things, holy smokes, the world can change. And we want to get ahead of the change, not behind it. Number four is energy innovation. Southern Company remains the only company in our industry that does proprietary, robust research and development. I'll touch on that in a minute. And then five is people. Now, five's not last, it's the foundation. And when I think about the issues related to innovation, there are what's, certainly, about innovation. But I think some of the most powerful things we can do when we talk about the what's and the how's of our business, I think the how's, our behaviors, our interactions with each other, with our customers, our external publics, are as important and perhaps more powerful than the what's. And so you will see me talk about that a bit. Now, one of the interesting things as I took over, I was really lucky in my second year to be able to celebrate the centennial of the Southern Company. Now, we have lots of companies that started back in the 1800s, but uh, we pulled them together and a year ago celebrated the first hundred years of our holding company. It was actually started in Alabama, but we knit together uh, these different companies and created a single electric network across Alabama, Georgia, and a variety of other southeastern states. And what was interesting is the guy that started that was a guy named Jay Mitchell. Now think about this guy. Here he is in the very early 1900s. as a guy that had the vision and courage to recognize the value of creating an entirely new industry, not one-off power generation project, but a grid. And at the same time, he's building the airplane, creating this industry. He goes over here and has to create a market for it. Imagine that. Now that is vision and courage and innovation at its best. Further, we had a guy that came right along after him, near and dear to Georgia, and that is a guy named Preston Arkwright. His innovation was innovation of culture. It was one designed to celebrate the notion that we must be citizens wherever we serve and to make the communities better off because we're there. That DNA, James Mitchell, Preston Arkwright, carries with us to this day. I'm going to skip forward in our history to another guy you may know, Alvin Vogel, Plant Vogel. But where you really know him from, raise your hands, please. How many people have ever seen the movie The Great Escape? That's Alvin Vogel. Alvin Vogel was the guy who escaped from uh, British, I mean, I'm sorry, German prisoner of war camps. He was a fly, an American flyer, flew with the RAF, got captured nine times, escaped ten, boom, he made it to Switzerland. He is actually in that movie, the composite of James Garner and Steve McQueen. That's pretty cool stuff. Well, what did he do beyond get innovative about escaping the Germans? 
what he did, and he, and he was chairman kind of in the 60s, very early 70s. He was a guy that recognized the world was changing. And if you remember that time in America, that was really, I think, the advent of environmentalism. It was the Clean Air Act. It was a variety of other things. It was also the time of the oil embargo. And so he realized there were very important scientific challenges facing this industry. And if Southern Company was going to lead the solution, we always provide our, pride ourselves on talking about not just providing rhetoric, we provide solutions. He went out to Virginia Tech. Now, you know Georgia Tech is going to crush Virginia Tech like a bunch of little grapes here next Thursday. <laughs> but he went to Virginia Tech and found this guy named Bill Harrison. Now, Harrison was a guy who was in the Manhattan Project working on the nuclear bomb, atomic bomb. And he was one of the most world-renowned research and development guys in America at the time. Brought him to Southern, sleepy old electric utility, and he started the research and development business. Now, we've given you two uh, party favors here. I, I think we've got 50 of them, but one is the is uh, uh, the book that we wrote about the history of research and development, Innovation at Southern. It's called Innovative Solutions. And then there's another smaller book called uh, Leadership Perspectives. There's a, I wrote that. There's a good bit of uh, innovation kind of stuff in there. We thought you'd enjoy that. Um, but anyway, so we started that. And originally at that time, the idea was that we would protect coal in America. You know, the United States is the world's largest provider of coal. It has 27% of coal reserves and all this wonderful stuff, right? And yet, we had to make it fit with the environment. And so at that time, we started a practice and started the science of liquefaction. That is, turning a coal resource into an oil-looking derivative. And at the same time, with the advent of the Clean Air Act, we started down a long road of innovation around environmental control equipment designed to improve the air quality. And I'm proud to tell you today that from our coal generation, we have removed 80% of the harmful effluents, and we have increased production something like 40%. So we've done a great job there. But the latest issue du jour, and you've seen this maybe recently with the Environmental Protection Agency, is not kind of knocks and socks and a variety of other things. It has to do with carbon. Well, here's what's interesting. The EPA standards that they put forth here just, I guess it was a week ago, last Wednesday, used our plant, Radcliffe, at Kemper County, Mississippi, as a standard for new coal plants in America. Fascinating stuff. This is a plant that uses native Mississippi lignite. We will take it. We will gasify it. We will remove 65% of the carbon dioxide. Here it's not a waste. We will push it in the ground and push out more domestically produced oil. With the remaining synthesis gas, we produce more electricity. More oil, more electricity, more tax base, more jobs. A great thing for decades to come for Mississippians. Beyond that, we are also looking at carbon capture after combustion. We're doing that in southern Alabama. More enhanced oil, um, uh, enhanced, uh, oil removal. So we're doing all that kind of practice. Pre-combustion, post-combustion. But I can tell you it's not just about carbon either. We have taken our game forward. We run the nation's only uh, Mercury Research Center. I think the issue of the future is not so much air as it is water. We have the only water reduction facility for power generation in America. We run the nation's only carbon capture research facility. We do that in the Department of Energy. All of these things are tied up in what we're doing right now. But it's not just coal. When I think about the future, and I give a lot of talks on 21st century energy policy, we've got to have the full portfolio. Nuclear, 21st century coal, natural gas, renewables, energy efficiency. We're building Plant Vogel, cleanest, safest, most efficient nuclear technology on the planet today. I mentioned Kemper County, 21st century coal. Carbon footprint better than natural gas. Natural gas itself, changing the game in America. And the reason why we've got more cheaper gas to date is technology innovation. It is drilling techniques which will allow us to access, in a more commercial way, 
deposits of natural gas we never thought were attainable 10 years ago. When I think about renewables, we work with Ted Turner. We're developing one of the leaders in America, solar technology, right here in the state of Georgia. We have the nation's largest voluntary solar program. We're importing wind, for heaven's sakes, from Oklahoma and Kansas. Isn't that interesting? And then energy efficiency. We should use less energy where we can. We should use more where we should. Fully 48% of the families we serve in the Southeast make less than 40,000 bucks a year. It is our obligation to represent these families. These families want to use energy, and they have a relatively inflexible energy budget, but they want to live in a better place. They want to educate their kids better. They want to eat better. They want better medical care. Raising the human existence will require them, in many cases, to use more energy. And we want to be there for them to use it in the most efficient manner possible. So this is a really interesting thing. Southern Company is the only company in America today committed to all that portfolio, committed $20 billion to do that. So that's a big deal. Now, I've talked about a lot of stuff here, but those are all a bunch of what's. Let me return to the hows. Now, remember the hows, I think, are more important and potentially more powerful than the what's. When I line up kind of innovation in our business and when I think about the people priority, they kind of go hand in hand. One of the things I can do as CEO of the Southern Company is to really be a champion for diversity. Now, when I say diversity, I bet that triggered a thought with most of y'all. That's race and gender, isn't it? But see, I think that misses the point. When we think about human innovation, we think about diversity as being a precursor to that. It is a determinant, not an outcome. And when I think about the, the broad quilt that is diversity in America today, it's not just race and gender, it's religion, it's sexual orientation, it's, it's national origin, it's, it's all kinds of things. So we measure this kind of determinants. We think that if we're successful in getting more determinants of diversity, that leads to outcomes of diversity, and that's really what we're after here. The outcomes of diversity are a broader set of skills, of knowledge, experience, context, and that's really what we're after. When I think about Southern Company, if you look at almost any metric, make, move, and sell electricity, we're among the nation's leaders in every one of those aspects. But I'm always fascinated by people that kind of live in the past, and I'll bet you 90% of the folks at Southern Company believe that they're the best in the world, and they probably are. However, one of the greatest predictors in business history of future failure is past success. And what we've got to do is find a way to constructively attack our own success. And so what we want to do is identify within the employee group a culture of revolutionaries. These are the 10% of the people that very often are the sand in the gears, and they ask the troubling questions. And you know these 90% of the people, when they're so successful, make, move, and sell for decades and successful today, what do they want to do to the revolutionaries? They want to kill them. And so it's my job, it's our job as leaders of the enterprise to identify them, protect them, and nurture them. Because without their vision and their courage as an organization, we will cease to be able to have the vision and courage to look around the corners and develop solutions to problems that don't yet exist. That's what really sustains a company going forward and will hopefully take Southern into the next hundred years. Now, I am proud to say that this is an awfully important issue. You know, when I think about America today, and really globally, with the economy being challenged, economic malaise, slow growth, unacceptably high unemployment, I think a lot of America is trying to 
dumb down our aspirations and talk about a new normal, one of the great things we can do as leaders of innovation around America is take as a lesson how successful we've been in the IT sector. When you go from IBM to you know, Microsoft to Facebook to all the goofy stuff we have today, Google and everything else, and all the stuff we haven't even thought about. How much value has America created for the economy of the world? See, I think the energy complex is right in that spot right now. And when I think about harnessing the power, excuse the pun, of the ability for the energy complex to serve an ever-growing economy, I think we can give Americans hope. When I think about those 48% of the families we serve, these families make tough kitchen table economic decisions every day. And I guarantee you they innovate about just making ends meet in their homes. As leaders here in our communities, what we have to do is harness the power of the people that we work with to develop innovative solutions, to find a way not just to play offense, but to give people hope and make the communities better because we're there. Play offense in otherwise a challenged environment. I swear to you, innovation in the energy complex and broadly with my other co-speakers is one of the ways we can make America better. Thank you very much.